So this is how I described what I'd like to do in the remaining 15 minutes or so. Uh, so it talks about building intuition around the parameters gamma and beta. And um, yeah. let me just delete this. Having good intuition for properties of gamma and beta it is useful, not in just uh, writing down Lorentz transformation, but also in answering um, various questions that relate to relativity. There's really a reason we define these parameters. Um, let me start out with the beta, even though it's not the first thing we define, so that I can use beta for the other, um, other definitions. So, Beta is defined as the speed at which something is moving, we divide by C, speed of light. Both of these quantities are that people um, have experienced measuring. <laughs> um, and given this beta, you can write down the gamma factor, which is 1 over square root of 1 minus beta squared. I just have this memorized. And um, the question says they are useful in writing down Lorentz transformation. And, and you know, they are. This is how Lorentz transformation look like. They are particularly symmetric and um, nice to look at in terms of beta, gamma, and C. Let me see if I can remember from scratch. So CT prime. So here, you know, frame. So let's see if you imagine... Uh, this is your frame S, then your frame S prime, it, it, quite standardly, is uh, defined as something that's moving in the positive x direction at some speed beta c. So, so this being the prime, the coordinate, ct prime is equal to gamma, the, this quantity again, ct uh, minus, and this is uh, uh, minus uh, beta times x. Um, it's a little bit easier to remember for the um, uh, for the other one, which is the transformation law for the x position. x prime is equal to, and there's a portion that really resembles uh, uh, a portion that resembles what we call Galilean relativity. Um, so that would be x minus um, beta ct. If we imagine this beta c being combined as a v, x minus vt, that's what you do assuming Galilean relativity when you have to describe a, co a coordinate of some object in terms of uh, for the two different uh, moving rel inertial reference frames. And what's uh, different about special relativity is that there's this factor gamma. Uh, but at least um, in the special in for the position coordinate, you can kind of imagine where this subtraction comes from. In terms of time coordinate, where these come from, it pops up in the derivation. <laughs> I don't think there's an intuitive way to explain other than to re-emphasize that uh, that the simultaneity is relative, which actually this equation says it is. So then that there's um, not much intuitive way you can get at that. And the other two spatial coordinates like y and z, in the simplest case, you would say, oh, nothing's moving in that direction. They, these coordinates don't change. That's the simplest case. So this is a Lorentz transformation. And you can see how in writing the Lorentz transformation, um, using these parameters of uh, parameters of gamma and beta really um, made the equation look elegant and possible even symmetric. You know, I have the gamma, this x is swapped to that, this ct is swapped to that. What's up with that? And um, which you know the lectures will go <laughs> further into. Um, so, so gamma and beta is actually useful for writing down Lorentz transformation. It helps me remember Lorentz transformation. If I had to look up Lorentz transformation like uh, the way your textbook does, uh, I mean, maybe I could remember it, but the way I would be remembering it is not by remembering every term in this uh, tr transformation law, 
but you know transformation lobbying uh, transformation lobbying this uh, i wouldn't remember lorenz transformation by remembering this i would remember it by remembering what i wrote down here it's much more symmetric you can kind of be reminded of the terms you might have forgotten uh, like the yeah so it's useful for that, but um, what I want to show you is that it's not useful just for that. It's uh, useful for other things. And I think uh, the full application of this, it's, uh, it, uh, it, it's easier to see late, uh, next to it when we are going to be dealing with relativistic energy and relativistic momentum. Because what you're going to see is that relativistic total energy it has this uh, really simple expression that uh, you know it's not something complicated like uh, one half mv squared or one half mv squared plus mgh all these terms that you have seen in um seen in classical mechanics it turns out they are much more complicated not maybe not much they are more complicated than the relativistically correct expression for total energy again which we'll cover next to it that's given by gamma times the rest mass times c squared that's it that's our total energy and the relativistic momentum will be gamma saying gamma there and times m times uh, a v velocity so you can kind of see the hint of the non-relativistic approximation here it's a little bit harder to see here i'll leave that for uh, <laughs> leave that for next week uh, but for now what i can say is that um, there's a really intimate relationship between energy and momentum which are very important dynamical quantities and gamma and oh uh, here it's written as mv but i can write it out this way gamma times m times uh, beta times c that's speed and then whatever direction the particle is going so when you look at gamma and beta there's a quite um, intertwined relationship so so we'll get to that next week with the relativistic dynamics I think for the remainder of today um want to get want you to have some number sense for beta and gamma which um which are described this way but i think um when you're trying to get a number sense for these quantities it's useful to have them uh, it's useful to have these uh, three different expressions, which I will numerically plot so that uh, I can start to gain that number sense. So uh, let, so one quantity is gamma, and um, I guess we can write it in terms of beta, one over square root of one minus beta squared. So that's what we had before. And um, we can solve for beta in this expression. I have done that before and got square root of 1 minus 1 over gamma squared. That's uh, sometimes useful. And I think there's a two other ways, which is basically writing these as a function of v. Uh, that's easy for beta. It's already been done beta as a function of v it's linear in v it's basically speed um, in units of c that's it um, and with the gamma um, you know i don't think uh, uh, somehow writing it out i mean you know I, I can write it out but i don't think that really gives us any more insight than i had before because um you know, this beta already is a speed in unit of C. So I think uh, I find that plotting that. Um, well, le let me leave it here and um, and show you some numerical plots to maybe try to gain some intuitive feel for this. Um, 
there are some properties that's uh, good to know, and you can kind of see them here. Um, with this expression, it's not immediately obvious, but maybe you remember uh, trivia like this. Uh, speed of light is the universal speed limit. If you know that as something that uh, someone who understands a, a little bit of modern physics should know, then great. <laughs> um, what this means is that V is less than or maybe equal to C. And putting in this relationship here actually gives you this uh, relationship that beta is less than or equal to 1. Because uh, V could be C, in that case it will be equal to 1, and uh, otherwise it's less than 1. And if we are talking about the absolute value of beta, as in the speed, not velocity, then this is, of course, also greater than, greater than or equal to zero. So that's one thing that um, puts a constraint around the gamma. And once you have that, then I think you see the constraints that are around, the, I'm sorry, so that's the constraint around the beta. Once you see that, then you see the constraints around the gamma as well. You know, imagine plugging this in. When you put in zero for beta, then I have one minus zero, one, square root of one, one. So we get uh, one as the smallest value that a gamma might take. This is when beta is equal to zero. And, um, in terms of upper limit, I hope you see that as beta approaches 1, not when it's equal to 1 because then you are dividing by 0, but as beta approaches 1, um, you get this. Uh, uh, 1 minus a number getting ever getting closer to 1, so it's a very small number. Square root it, square root of a very small number is still kind of small. 1 divided by that small number. It's large. So this gamma has no upper limit. So as the beta approaches one, gamma will approach infinity. And uh, and that's what you do see on a plot here. Let me see if I can plot this. So um, your textbook kind of has a version of this plot. Um, let's see. So I'm trying to, let me. Declare my variable, beta, and I'm trying to plot uh, gamma, which is 1 over square root of 1 minus beta from, uh, I don't know if I remember the syntax, beta going from, I think 0 is fine. I don't know if I want it to go to 1, 0 0.9, maybe. What does it plot? <laughs> um, if it doesn't do something reasonable, I will look up the syntax and yeah, okay. So this is what it plots. And for this plot, I stopped it at beta equals 0 0.9, and it maxes out at 3 point whatever. But um, I'm not limited to that. I don't have to stop at 0 0.9. I can go to 0 0.99. Then gamma maxes out at around 10 but I don't have to stop at 0 0.99. I can um, go another nine. And I hope you, you are beginning to see the pattern here. So as beta asymptotic, as beta approaches one, this uh, will be approaching a vertical asymptote. So beta will never, for massive particles, beta can never equal one. And as beta ever gets closer, ever infinitesimally get closer and closer to one, your gamma will increase without limit. So let me just do one more and one more. So at some point of a scale of a gamma, it's uh, like all these are so small compared to this that it's basically zero uh, or basically one. And uh, let me just put many more nines here. At some point, uh, it'll complain, I think. But um, yeah, okay, yeah, I think I messed it up. 
uh, I don't know how it's plotting, but I think I don't have enough uh, samples for that. Uh, so, anyways, uh, so yeah, that's uh, uh, how gamma depends on beta, and this relationship is a bit. Um, at some point, it's um, a bit pathological in that it's not um, very well behaved. Uh, I mean, you know, normally when you look at numbers like zero point and four nines and zero point and five nines, we are used to think of used to thinking of those as two basically same numbers. Uh, they are basically one, but uh, when you are looking at the value of gamma whether it's four nines or whether it's uh, five nines actually has a big difference. So it's, uh, um, I, I guess that's what I mean pathological. They are not well behaved. What you will see much better behaved is uh, beta in terms of gamma. So let me plot beta as a function of gamma. So I'm going to, let me declare variable gamma again. And uh, let me just plot square root of 1 minus 1 divided by gamma squared. Oh, wait, wait, sorry. Uh, when I was plotting, I was plotting, sorry. <laughs> when I was plotting gamma, this should have been squared. And what that will do is that actually makes it even worse because, uh, wait, does it make it worse? You know, I think it makes it actually slightly better because uh, this thing that I had before, if this is squared, then slightly better behaved because well not that much better behaved um yeah so note that missing square from previous results but in terms of the qualitative behavior that square doesn't really matter that much let me plot uh, beta as a function of gamma so beta is a function of gamma goes as square root of one minus one over gamma squared and gamma is, uh, this is where I have to be careful. Gamma goes, starts from one. And uh, let's say gamma equals 10. It, that's actually quite relativistic. That's where uh, there's a factor of 10, time dilation or length contraction. Um, this, this is the behavior you see. And I think um, um, in some sense, uh, this might not look all that well behaved because as you plot bigger and bigger gamma um, in in comparison to the scale, this looks like a very sharp corner. Um, so you know, other than it's a sharp corner approaching horizontal asymptote, <laughs> maybe um, where this. Uh, um, Beta as a function of gamma is useful is, so, you know, um, at very high gamma, you can basically treat beta as equal to one. Uh, that itself is, I think, useful because um, in that limit, so, you know, whether I'm comparing gamma going up to 50 or whether I'm uh, looking at gamma going up to 100, um, the kind of the num amount of precision I keep in gamma it it, uh, it doesn't get worse. Um, I actually, when I specify gamma with uh, two, three significant figures, I actually know beta much better than two or three significant figures in terms of the number of nines. Um, where it's uh, actually interesting is uh, in the small gamma limit, as in where you have gamma that's close to one. So maybe gamma plus one times 10 to the power of minus two or maybe even smaller than that, 10 to the power of minus five. So this would be like a non-relativistic regime. And that's where you see this uh, kind of a nice-ish relationship uh, between gamma and beta. It's, uh, um, so as the gamma increases tiny bit over one, uh, your beta goes from zero if this uh, reminds you of uh, kind of rotated around the parabola, that's because it is. Because uh, the gamma factor will relate to kinetic energy. And as you might remember, kinetic energy goes as one half mv or m beta c squared. So 
So this is the kind of the low speed version that's showing that correspondence with the um, with the non relativistic results that you are familiar with. So so yeah, I think I just wanted to talk about these relativistic parameters, gamma and beta, um, and their numerical properties. Because um, having this sense of intuition about their numerical properties will help you when you. Um, when you work through relativistic dynamics, and you will see some algebra tips later on that actually relate to these uh, later on as in next week. Um, but in the meantime, I just want you to bring some attention to these two relativistic parameters that you will see a lot as you work with relativity and it's worth developing some sense of intuition.